parameters around the session and just to give you a sense as to what we're diving into and, and how this will flow. So uh, I am a practicing attorney. I represent startups, entrepreneurs, founders. I represent venture funds, uh, seed investors, institutional investors, and so forth. Um, and I've been doing it for 25 years, did a couple of startups myself along the way. So have a lot of experience in the space and have seen it and worked in it from a lot of different angles. Um, I also teach a, at a handful of different law schools, including the University of Michigan, um, where I teach uh, mergers and acquisitions class every spring. And, uh, and I do a lot of these sorts of sessions. And, and really my objective here is to get down to the basics around fundraising and financing. And um, I'm targeting first time founders. So if you've never, if you are a entrepreneur or a new founder, you really have no fluency with these sorts of legal terms. Um, this is a great session for you to sort of get an understanding as to where these things come from, what they mean, how they knit together. If you have done this before, um, or if you have some other experience, and so you know what a convertible note is, or you know what a cap table is, um, I still think you'll get something out of it. It's worth your time and worth your while. Maybe it'll help you uh, synthesize some of these um, concepts which have just been floating around loosely in your head. So um, I do it through a whiteboard. If we were in person, I would literally have a whiteboard with markers, uh, but I have a virtual whiteboard app and that's what we will leverage and use for this session. I'm gonna speak the entire time. We have a lot to cover um, and that way I can just sort of maximize the content that I'm able to deliver. Um, but I'm also gonna put my email address um, at the beginning of the first slide um, when I open that up. And um, I would encourage you to shoot me any questions that you may have, depending upon the volume and the number of questions. Um, I will try to get back to you as quickly as I can um, in that, with that sort of follow-up, but I'd be happy to do that. So I don't want you to feel like um, you're limited in terms of being able to ask questions or follow up with on, on points that maybe were unclear to you. So without any further ado, um, let's jump into this. And Piper, I'm going to ask you to confirm that you can see the whiteboard when I have it pulled up. Is the whiteboard showing? Yep, it's actually uh, loading. We see it. Great. Every okay, terrific. So here we go. So here's, we'll start with my email address. It is David dot Wilbrand at Thompson Hine, all one word, dot com. So nice and long. So there you go. So, so let's jump in. We have 51 minutes and let's make maximum impact. So when I give this talk and, and present these subjects uh, and this subject matter, I like to start with a balance sheet, which might seem like a strange way to start a legal talk with an accounting concept. But I think it's a useful way for us to level set and to really get a handle on what we're talking about and why. So when you look at a balance sheet, you have assets on the left, and you have liabilities over equity on the right. Now, a lot of these concepts that we're going to talk about today um, are not intuitive. Um, they're the sort of concepts that need to be explained because otherwise they really have no meaning that's, that's obvious or clear. But I think with a balance sheet, you probably all have a general common sense idea, at least, as to what we're talking about, if not you know, a real handle on the accounting concepts. When you're looking at assets, you're looking at what's good in your business. It's your intellectual property, it's your technology, it is the assets that you have on hand, it's your cash, it's your accounts receivable, anything good, the good stuff. Those are your assets. Likewise, liabilities, that's the bad stuff. It's what you owe the bank, it's what you owe the landlord, it's what you owe your lawyer, it's what you owe your employees, your contractors, so on and so forth. So if we look at this mathematically, we have assets equal liabilities plus equity. That's why it's called a balance sheet, because the sides must balance. And if we play around with those inputs a little bit, we get a little STEMI, um, we can say assets minus liabilities equals equity. Good stuff minus the bad stuff equals equity. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because if you are in particular a tech or a biotech entrepreneur, the sorts of entrepreneurs that I tend to work with, um, you are emphasizing 
research and development and product development and market share over profitability and maybe even over revenues. Um, what you're looking to do is grow, grow, grow. And the ultimate monetization event for you, the ultimate point where you make your money is when you sell your business. Um, and, and as I mentioned, I teach M&A and there are lots of different ways to structure a merger and acquisition or an exit transaction or a liquidity event. These are all the same thing. Um, but at its very, very fundamental basics, what happens with an exit event is you convert, you exchange all your good stuff, all your assets for money. Okay, so you've worked for a year, three years, five years, seven years, 12 years at the bottom of the mine. You've done the work and there's a big fish that's very interested in what you've built and they give you cash for your assets. Great. You turn around, you pay off your liabilities and whatever's left goes to equity. Another way to express this is when you convert your assets to cash or you sell them for cash. The cash represents your gross proceeds. You take out the liabilities, you pay off the liabilities. What's left are your net proceeds. Why all this buildup? Well, that's you, okay? The net proceeds are you. That's what you get as the owner, okay? So you take the good stuff, convert it to cash, pay off the bad stuff, and whatever's left over is, is left over for you as the owner. And the whole point of this talk is to help you have a grasp on how that works and what it means. And so you know what you're getting and potentially what you give up along the way. So the next obvious question becomes, how do these net proceeds get allocated? Okay, so you've done the work, who gets what? Well, if there's one owner in the business, it's pretty simple. This person gets 100%. But what if there are three owners, 12 owners, 47 owners, 127 owners, 412 owners, what do we look to? How do we know how to allocate the net proceeds? And what we look to is something that we call the capitalization table. And you'll sometimes hear this referenced in short as a cap table. That's because accountants and lawyers run these things and we're super creative with the kind of branding that we can apply to these concepts that really pushes it for us. Um, so what's a cap table do? Well, the cap table gives us instructions as to how to allocate net proceeds. This is why a cap table is important because if your cap table is inaccurate, if your cap table is incomplete, then you don't know how net proceeds are going to be allocated. And along the way, maybe that's not a day-to-day -day crisis, but I can promise you it is a crisis when you get to the moment where you actually have the money on the table. And I've seen that happen and it's uncomfortable and nobody wants those sort of knives out scenarios. So let's make sure our capitalization table is correct. So if you think about a capitalization table in its rawest, most basic form, it's going to look like this. And let's say we have three founders. We have founder A, B, and C. They're destined to work together because their names magically align. And this column we'll call shares. Put a pin in that for a moment. And this column is ownership percentage. So when I sit down with a founding team for the first time, after talking to them about, you know, getting through the introductions, talking about the pandemic, you know, whatever it is we do to break the ice, and then we're actually getting in and we're talking about their business and their value proposition and their goals and objectives, and then when we cut through all of that and we're starting to get in, into, into specifics and I ask them about the cap table, I always start with the bottom right corner. 100%. Because the ownership percentages need to add up to 100%. Now, you're thinking to yourself, okay, I showed up for this Zoom session at 9 o'clock in the morning. I even took a shower first so that you can tell me that the percentages need to add up to 100% deep insight, Will Brand. And I would tell you that, yes, it seems obvious, but you would be surprised the number of times when I sit down with a founding team and team member A says, it was my idea. I'm the CEO. Um, I'm dedicating my full time and attention to this. And as we all discussed, I own 70% of the company. And founder B says, I'm the tech co-founder. We all know how important that is. Everybody needs a tech co-founder. And as we all discussed, 
I own 40% of the company. And founder C says, well, hey, you know, I'm the sales and marketing person. And without me, this is just a science fair project. You know, you need me in the mix to figure out the go to market strategy and to actually get it to market and to generate some revenue to demonstrate that we've got product market fit, yada, yada, yada. And as we all discuss, I own 40%. I'm like, look, you know, we're all high achievers in this room. And I appreciate the fact that, you know, you guys want to give 150% to this effort, but that math just doesn't work. And so you need to go back to your whiteboard and sort that out before we can take another step. Because at 150%, I don't know how to chop up net proceeds. And if I don't know how to chop, chop up net proceeds, we've got a real problem that we don't want to have. So we've got to sort this out. And as founders, I will say, this is one of the most difficult conversations you will ever have, which is the initial allocation of equity among the two of you, the three of you, the four of you, the seven of you, whatever the initial group is. And it can be anything from you know, a third, a third, a third. That's a default position some people fall to. But sometimes it's you know, 95, three, two. It's highly circumstantial, very much based upon um, the relative relevance and importance and role played by each person. And that varies company to company. Um, but anyhow, in our little example here, let's assume that our founders went back to the drawing board and they decided to go with a 60, 20, 20 split. Terrific. So now it adds up to 100%. We're in good shape. But notice I started with the percentage column. I didn't start with the column that is entitled shares. Why is that? Because that's the way most people talk, right? People will talk about the number of shares they own. Well, the reason is, is because this column, shares, only matters with respect, it's relative. It's, it's importance, it's relevance is relative to ownership percentage. That's the only reason we care. That's what shares do, okay? These are ownership interests in the entity. They're sort of a tangible representation of this ownership percentage. You know, 100,000 years ago, we collected nuts and berries on the savannah and we're tangible people. We like to hold things in our hands. We like to be able to visualize, visualize these things. Ownership percentages are amorphous, they're ideas, but ownership interest is, is a representation. It's something we can hold on to, we can get our head around. It's representative, we like that as humans. So the question becomes, what do we do with this column? Well, if you have an LLC, which is an acronym for limited liability company. These might be called ownership interests. They might be called membership interests. They might be called units. They might be called shares. It doesn't really matter. These are all basically synonyms. What you look to is something called an operating agreement, which is your basic governance document for an LLC. And however they're defined in that document, that's the terminology you use. It's probably one of those things that I just mentioned. If you have a corporation, it's much more straightforward. They're either going to be shares or shares of stock. But in every case, they are ownership interests and they're representative of what you own in the company and they translate, they need to tie out to ownership percentages. So the question then becomes, how many do we use? And that's up to you. So we could do six shares, two shares, two shares for a total of 10. That absolutely works. Or we could do six million shares, two million shares, two million shares for a total of 10 million shares. That absolutely works. Is there any substantive difference between the two? And the answer is no, none. Six divided by 10 is the same thing as six million divided by 10 million. So if somebody says to you, I am founder A, and that would be weird because that's an unusual name, but you know, maybe you have unusual friends. Um, person says, I'm founder A, and I hold six shares in my startup, you, you might intuitively say to them, well, that seems low and kind of weak. And you're making all these sacrifices and you're doing all this work and engaging in all this effort for six shares. Well, maybe you're right. Maybe they are a dummy. Probably a dummy if the denominator is 10 million. Okay, six shares divided by 10 million shares is an awfully small percentage. But if the total number of shares is 10 and they own six, 60% of the company is a lot. That's a huge allocation of equity. 
That is a huge opportunity, a big chunk of those future net proceeds. So the point is, is shares on a standalone basis have no objective meaning. They only matter relative to ownership percentage. And I realize that I've said that now probably 17 times. Um, and I'm hitting it hard because it's a very common misunderstanding. And it's important for you to really get your head wrapped around that as a founder or as a participant in these ventures. It's important to understand how shares work and how the real key thing here is ownership percentages. Okay. So this is where we, this is where we start. I will say that most tech startups like to use big numbers, biotech startups too. And frankly, it's psychological. Um, it gives you the chance to issue big share numbers to people for just the reason that I said, even though six over 10 is the same as 6 million over 10 million, still 6 million nuts and berries feels like more than six nuts and berries, even if we try to rationalize to ourselves that it's the same. So we just make the emotional leap, we make the psychological give, and we say, fine, we're just using big numbers. And it's as simple as that, okay? That's why these sorts of startups use these big numbers of shares. It's purely a psychological bump with no economic importance or relevance whatsoever. That's it. So the next question becomes, and let's break this apart a little bit. Let's talk about these shares a little bit more, these ownership interests. And you probably have heard some of these terms before. There are really two types of shares. There are common shares and there are preferred shares. Now this is a generality but it's a generality that applies in 999 times out of you know, 1,000 cases. It's extraordinarily common, it is market, it is the culture, and it is this. If you are receiving your shares for services, you get common shares. Who's getting their shares for services? Well, founders employees, executives, directors, consultants, contractors, anyone who is being awarded equity, being issued shares in exchange for services is going to get common shares. So who gets preferred shares? Those who invest money. Your investors get preferred shares. And why wouldn't they? Because wouldn't you prefer that? Um, see what I did there, not bad for 923. Um, hey, you know, the session was free. So the difference between common shares and preferred shares, not as profound as you might think, or perhaps as the hype might lead you to believe. It's important to note that at a very high level, subject to extremely unusual circumstances, on a relative basis, they are the same. It's one to one. So if we want to flash back to our cap table, if we would still represent these as 6 million, 2 million, 2 million, even if say this wasn't founder C, let's say this was an angel investor as indicated by wings and a halo. And let's say they had purchased 2 million shares. And we're gonna talk more about that in a little bit. So let's say these are common, 6 million common shares for founder A, 2 million common shares for founder B, and then 2 million preferred shares for angel investor C, we still are gonna work with a total of, a ten, of 10 million shares and the ownership percentage is still tracked the same. So the, the preferred shares aren't supercharged from an allocation perspective or a percentage ownership perspective. They're the same, one-to-one -one with common. That's extremely important. That's 95% of the game, okay? Now we're gonna get into the other 5%, which is relevant, but I just want you to know that these are, it's, it's more on the edge. So what else are we looking at? Well, investors like preferred stock because there, is, there are some issues or matters or advantages of control or governance that tend to attach to preferred stock. And what is that? Well, it tends to show up in two places. First of all, um, investors oftentimes, particularly if they're, if they're investing a substantial amount and particularly if they have some level of sophistication, or going to want a seat on your board of directors, okay? So the common framework with a corporation for sure, but even most LLCs that, that are uh, in this space, they tend to track this sort of structure, is that your stockholders, your owners, sit up top, and your stockholders elect directors. 
And your directors in a corporation are charged with general oversight for the direction of the business and direction of the company. Um, the buck stops with them in terms of making core strategic decisions and even getting into tactics. Um, but one of the key things that directors do is they elect officers, okay? These are the executives. So from a control perspective, from a governance perspective, preferred stockholders like to have the opportunity themselves to elect one director. So maybe they elect one director and the founders elect two directors. So you have a board of three. So they're still in the minority. You can outvote them. So you've got control over things like this, which you want, you know, who the officers are, those sorts of things. But they have the opportunity to sit in the room, to influence decisions, to hear your thinking, um, and that matters to them. So preferred stockholders will, fre will frequently ask for a board seat. They also will frequently ask for something called protective provisions. Sometimes those are known as veto rights. And those would be exercised by them in their capacity as stockholders. So if you note here, this is a fairly typical cap table because you'll notice that our investor here owns 20% of the company, which is a minority interest, meaning less than 50%. And by default rules of governance, Majority rules. So 80 will always defeat 20 when it comes time to vote. And investors are okay with that as a general matter. You know, they, they want the founders to drive the bus. They're comfortable with the founders driving the bus. They don't need um, to be the point of last resort and to have that kind of control. But there are certain decisions over which they do want to have influence. And they tend to be the major organic decisions relating to the company and really getting to its monetization. So things like raising more money, they're gonna to wanna to have a veto right over that. Selling the company, they're gonna to wanna to have a veto right over that. Changing the size of the board, they're gonna to wanna to have a veto right over that. The decision to distribute cash from the company to the stockholders, they're gonna to wanna to have a veto right over that. And notice I say veto, they don't have the right to make that happen. They can't say, we need to sell the company, so you have to go do it. That's not how these protective provisions or these veto rights work. Instead, what happens is this 80%, these founders have decided that they wanna do something, and if that thing falls within the bucket of veto rights or the bucket of protective provisions, this investor's approval, their consent is required. That's why they're called protective, it protects them from the founders doing something which perhaps would be highly disadvantageous or detrimental to this particular investor. So those sorts of veto rights, those sorts of protective provisions are baked into the preferred stock. So by virtue of having a board seat and by virtue of getting some veto rights, that's the control and governance advantage that is associated with preferred stock. The other prong of preferred stock is indeed economic, okay? And it works, generally speaking, like this. Note the key provision that I made. It's still a one-to-one -one ratio, okay, as it relates to the value of the units or the shares and how they tie out to ownership percentages. But when you're talking about preferred stock, and if you're looking at a preferred stock term sheet, you're going to want to pay attention to a section called liquidation. Now, this is a provision that a lot of entrepreneurs drive by. They don't pay attention to liquidation, and it's because it sounds bad. You're thinking about teenagers standing on a street corner with placards, you know, 90% off, everything must go, going out of business sale, we're liquidating. And that's certainly a liquidation. But there's another kind of liquidation. Let's go back to our first slide. Done the hard work. You've exchanged your assets for cash. You've converted those assets into cash. You paid off your liabilities. At this point, the net proceeds are still inside the company. How do you get those net proceeds into the hands of the owners? How do you crack open that egg? You liquidate. So if you sell the company for a billion dollars and you pay off liabilities in some small amount, so there's a ton of money left, how do you get it out to the stockholders, to the owners, you liquidate. Liquidation's important. So in this term sheet, we wanna understand how liquidation works. 
because there can be bad liquidations, the going out of business sale, but there can be awfully good liquidations. So this really goes to the core, the guts of what it is that you're trying to achieve. When you're looking um, and you're working your way through this paragraph, this is one of the most jargon heavy portions of a term sheet. And I think that's another reason why founders and entrepreneurs tend to run away from it um, because it just seems scary. They think it probably doesn't apply to them. So they just breeze by it and they focus on things like what's the board structure, which is a good thing to look at, but you need to focus on liquidation. Two words I want you to look at in the liquidation section. I want you to look at the word preference and I want you to look at the word participation. Preference first is always expressed as a multiple of what you paid or what the investor paid for their shares. Sometimes it's called purchase price. Sometimes the jargon that you'll see is it's called original issue price or OIP. It's just what you paid. So if you paid a dollar a share, your original issue price is a dollar per share, your purchase price is a dollar per share. And the preference will, will be expressed as blank times the original issue price. And 999 times out of 1,000, it's one time, okay? The preference is 1x, the original issue price. So if the original issue price is a dollar per share, and we'll talk about this in a second, how you get there. If the original issue price is a dollar per share, then the preference is one times the original issue price or the preference is one dollar itself. Okay, easy enough. Participation, how does this work? Well, there are two types of preferred stock and one type is called participating preferred and the other type is called non-participating preferred. And the way that you can tell the difference easily when you're reading a term sheet is participating preferred is designated or signaled by the use of the word and, and non-participating preferred is designated or signaled by the use of the word or. So it'll read something like this. In the event of the liquidation of the company, cracking the egg, getting those net proceeds in the hands of the owners, the preferred stockholders, the investors, will get the greater of their liquidation preference, one times the original issue price, or what they would get simply by applying their ownership percentage. What does this mean? Well, if you invested a million dollars in the company and the company sells for a million dollars, or let's say the net proceeds are a million dollars, you would only stand to get $200,000 of that by applying your ownership percentage. But if the net proceeds are a million dollars and you invested a million dollars, well, that's your liquidation preference. You're gonna take that. You're just gonna take the full million bucks. It's downside protection. In the event of a really crummy outcome, the investor has the chance to scrape the money out of the company first. But, you know, if it's a billion dollar outcome, oh, you're going to take 20%, right? You're not going to take your preference. So non-participating preferred is really only impacting in the case of a bad liquidation, okay? In the case of a good liquidation, non-participating preferred plays side by side with common stock and everybody acts the same way just like you as a founder. Participating preferred is an and. It doesn't matter if it's a bad liquidation or a good liquidation, they always get both. So they get their liquidation preference, they get their money back, and they get their ownership percentage as a percentage or an allocation from the net proceeds, okay? They get both. So, you know, obviously as a default rule, investors, tend to like participating preferred, and founders tend to like non-participating preferred. One is not you know, objectively better than the other. It's not like it's a good or a bad or a good or evil sort of thing. This is not a morality contest. It's economics, okay? It's the terms of the deal. So you're negotiating valuation, which we'll talk about next. Um, you're negotiating board structure, and you're negotiating whether your preferred stock is participating or non-participating, okay? It's as simple as that. So don't leap to judgment around it. Obviously, you're going to want to understand your default positions depending upon which category you play. Um, but as a general matter, this is how it sorts out.
So let's talk a little bit. I just mentioned valuation and I mentioned price per share. So let's talk about that next. Because when you're ready to take investment, congratulations, um, it becomes important to figure out how to reflect that on the cap table. If somebody is going to invest a million dollars in your company or $5,000 in your company, you need to know how many shares they are buying, how many units they are buying. Because as we have emphasized throughout, your cap table needs to be up to date. We need to get them onto the cap table. And we do that by issuing them shares, by selling them shares. So then our ownership percentages will adjust and everything will add up to 100%. So let's just work through that and understand how this flows. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna put two equations on the whiteboard and then we'll break them down piece by piece. So the first equation is pre-money valuation divided by pre-money equity equals price per share or PPS. Second equation, investment amount divided by price per share equals number of shares. This is what we're solving for. We want to know how many shares we're selling to this investor. Or the investor wants to know how many shares they're getting. So let's work backwards. We've talked about the investment amount. Say it's a million dollars. Great. So in order to determine the number of shares, we need to know what the den denominator is. What's the price per share? Well, we don't know that yet, but we know how to calculate it. We flash up to equation number one. So let's look first at the denominator. I know you guys are all smart. You know that pre is a prefix, means before. Money, you know, means money. See, this is not hard. I want to keep it basic. Before the money, in other words, before this investment amount, what was the equity or what were the total shares? And let's go back to our example. Let's say it was 10 million. Let's go back and say it was three founders, A, B, and C, added up to 10 million shares. Okay, before this investment, pre-money, there were 10 million shares. Well, great. So now we're, we're almost done. We just have to get to the numerator. Before the money, before the million dollars, what's the valuation of the company? Ah, okay. Pretty important. Let me show you a different slide, different way to express some of these terms, and then let's talk about it a little bit. Pre-money valuation plus investment amount equals post money valuation. Really simple, right? So whatever the company was worth before the investment, and then you add to that all that cash they got, which adds value, now you have your post money valuation or after the money valuation. Why am I showing you this equation in connection with showing you these equations? Well, number one, I just want you to understand and, and visualize what these terms mean. But this particular slide is very important because this is actually, particularly at the earliest stages, how we often see valuation computed. And it's not necessarily computed as a negotiated price between the parties. It starts with a percentage. So let's talk about that for a second. We know our investment amount is a million dollars. What often happens is I will get a call from my client, the founders, and they'll say, David, great news. Um, we've got a deal uh, for a million dollar investment. We finally found our angel or angels. They've agreed to invest a million dollars. We're all really excited. And we've decided, we've agreed, we've negotiated that that million dollars will buy 20% of the company. Okay? So when the dust settles, that investor will own 20% of the company. And so I do the math and I think, okay, well that means that the post money valuation must be $5 million, right? Because 1 million divided by 5 million is 20%. And that's what their deal is. 
So by telling me that $1 million buys 20% of the company, you're telling me that the post money valuation is $5 million. And if I know that the post money valuation is $5 million, and I know that the investment amount is $1 million, then working backwards, very STEMI, I know my pre-money valuation is $4 million. So I may say to the founders, oh, interesting, that's great. You know, you were able to negotiate a pre-money valuation of $4 million. And they'll say, huh? Because frequently that didn't even come up. They didn't think about valuation that way. The investor didn't think about valuation that way. The entire time they were negotiating percentage. They were negotiating 10%, 15%, 20%, 25%, 30%, whatever. And they landed on 20%. And it's perfectly fine. It's a way people negotiate valuations all the time. But we do need to get it back to a pre-money valuation because we need to know what our input is here. Okay? Now, just to keep things easy, because we're moving fast and I was a history major, so doing math in real time can sometimes be a challenge for me. Let's instead say that our pre-money valuation happened to be $10 million, just for the sake of easy math. If the pre-money valuation is $10 million, $10 million divided by 10 million shares means we have a price per share of $1, okay? We insert that here into our second equation. $1 million investment amount divided by $1 means we're selling 1 million shares. Got it? Okay, so now what does our cap table look like? Our cap table is starting to get a little messy but that's not a bad thing. It means you're selling stock. So we're happy about that. We have founder A, we have founder B, we have founder C, and we have our angel, okay? And we have common shares. We have preferred shares. Here's gonna be our roll up. Sometimes this is called CSE, common stock equivalents, but it's where we just add them together. And that's the column from which we base our ownership percentages. So, we know back from our first, one of our initial slides, that founder A owns 6 million shares of common, founder B owns 2 million shares of common, and founder C owns 2 million shares of common. Our angel didn't buy any, com any common, so this column is 10 million. Our founders don't have any preferred, so zero, 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 but our angel investor bought 1 million shares of preferred, so this total is 1 million shares. Our roll up, remember it's all one to one, 6 million, 2 million, 2 million, 1 million for a total of 11 million. Okay? And now we run our percentages off of this. And I wish I would have picked some different numbers so our percentages would have been cleaner. But part of the point I want to raise here is that without actually getting into it, we know that now this person owns less than 60% of the company. Okay? Before they sold stock, it was 6 million divided by 10 million for 60%. Now it's 6 million divided by 11 million for less than 60%. Two points I wanna raise from this. First of all, note that the number of shares held stayed the same. A lot of founders think that when they're selling stock, they're selling stock from their own pocket, that somehow this 10 million number is fixed. That's not true. It's always additional stock, it's new stock. Um, lawyers will call it newly issued stock. Okay, so the denominator increases, the total number of shares increase, but because it's not 6 million divided by 10 million, because it's 6 million divided by 11 million, the ownership percentage is less than 60% now. That's called dilution, okay? So dilution shows up not because the number of shares gets less, it doesn't, but dilution shows up because the ownership percentage drops because we've added more shares to the denominator. And the whole point about dilution, it's really kind of a similar concept to what we just talked about when we talked about participating preferred versus non-participating preferred. Um, participating preferred is not existentially evil. Dilution is not existentially evil. It's just something for you to understand and appreciate and if you decide to incur it, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. So if you're going to issue a stockholder, an investor, preferred stock, participating preferred stock, make sure you understand what it means and that you're comfortable with it, that you're getting sufficient value for that. Same with dilution, okay? If you're going to incur dilution, that's okay, 
if what you're going to do is take this million dollar investment and blow out the value of the company. You know, the state, the common statement always is it's better to own 10% of a company worth a billion dollars than to own 90% of a company worth a million dollars. Obvious, right? Well, it happened because that person was willing to incur dilution. They went from 90% to 10%, which probably hurt their heart um, while it happened, but it was ultimately for the good. So again, these things aren't morality plays. It's just a question of the economics of it and are you getting bang for your buck? Okay, so in the 15 minutes that we have left, what I wanna get into are a couple of other deal structures. At this point, hopefully, you understand what happens in an M&A event. Well, first of all, you understand what M&A means, mergers and acquisitions, so congratulations. You understand what net proceeds are. You understand that cap tables are important because those ownership percentages tell us how to chop up and allocate net proceeds when it comes to the end of the rainbow moment. You know the difference between common stock and preferred stock, that common is for services and preferred is for money. You know some of the elements of preferred stock, control and governance around boards, around protective provisions. You understand what a preference is. You understand participating preferred versus non-participating preferred. And now you understand how to calculate the number of shares that get issued to an investor when they invest in your company. And you know how that math works and you know how it ties back to valuation and you understand dilution. So, you know, in 40 minutes, we've covered a lot of ground. But note something that I just said, valuation. In order to calculate the number of shares that we're selling, in order to actually do the deal, you need to agree on valuation. And what happens if you can't? Well, there was a time where that happened all the time. And that happened in the dot-com bubble, which some of you may remember, roughly 1996 to 2000. And what happened in that era is valuations of dot-coms were skyrocketing. Um, but there wasn't real precedent around what a valuation of a dot-com could be because, or should be, because these were brand new things. And founders and investors couldn't agree. So you remember my last example where they had agreed that, you know, they would sell 20% of the company or, you know, directly or indirectly had agreed that the company had a $4 million valuation. Well, the spaces here were just vast. Founders thought their companies were worth $60 million, $100 million. And investors were saying, eh, how about a million dollars? How about $2 million? All you have is a PowerPoint presentation. So they couldn't agree on valuation. They wanted to do a deal, but they couldn't agree on valuation. And if you can't agree on valuation, then you can't get a deal done because you can't run your math. You, can't, you don't know how many shares you're selling. So what was hit upon was a different solution. And it came about this way. Remember our balance sheet. If we're selling shares, we're living in the equity box. And we need a valuation for that if we're going to sell shares. But what some players realized is they said, you know, there's another quadrant on the right side of the balance sheet, liabilities. And if we can't agree on valuation and if the parties still want to do a deal, instead of selling equity, why don't we sell debt? Okay, so this $1 million investment will come into the company as debt, not as equity. So how does that look? Well, you have a principal amount which is the amount contributed or invested or loaned or advanced a million dollars. You have to have an interest rate because the IRS doesn't believe that people loan money for free. Could be 3%, could be 20%. It's usually 8%. Any real reason for that? No. Somebody popped that in a field in 1997 and it stuck. Sometimes it's six, sometimes it's 10, you know, it can float around, but most of the time it's eight. And then the other thing you need is a maturity date. When does this come due? And note that these notes are not set up as like car loans or mortgages. You're not paying principal and interest every month. Instead, it just all comes due at the end. So what's the moment of truth? When do you have to repay this? And generally it's 18 to 24 months. That's usually what you see with these notes. So this was a solution, right? We were able to figure out a way to get a million dollars into the company without calculating valuation. So winning, right? Mission accomplished. Well, it worked for about 18 seconds and then everybody was angry at the lawyers. And you would say, well, of course, because everybody's always angry at the lawyers. And I would agree with that. 25 years of doing this, that's kind of the normal state of play. That's how civilization rolls. But there was a specific reason for that here. 
from the founder perspective, this maturity date terrified them because remember, these aren't businesses that are creating profits. They're not, they may not even be creating revenues, right? They're grow, grow, grow. And so they're not going to have the money to repay this investment. The benefit of stock, if you sell stock is, is you get the money, you use the money, you have no obligation to pay it back. And then, you know, of course the investors in it for the bang that they're going to get at the end of the road. Okay. But they're not looking for repayment along the way with a note. There was this repayment obligation and founders hated it and it just didn't work. But you know what? Investors hated it too because they wanted to play for the end of the rainbow. They wanted 20% of a billion dollar deal. They didn't want to invest a million dollars in a high risk startup for 8% interest per year. That's not very attractive. That's not enough to keep them interested and engaged. So both parties were upset. So they came back to the accountants and lawyers and said, is there something we can do? And the accountants and lawyers said, you know what? It sounds like what you really want to do is you want to start as a note because it gets you out of this valuation debate, but you want to figure out a way to turn that liability into equity at some point. In other words, to convert it, to convert the note into equity. And hence was born the convertible note, sometimes called a convertible note, a convertible seed note, a convertible promissory note. If your lawyer wants to really gouge you, they will call it a convertible venture or convertible bond. They all mean the same thing, so don't let them fool you. Um, it's just a, an expression of a type of a debt instrument. It's an obligation to repay, and it's convertible from a liability to equity. Well, when does it convert? Well, it converts, generally speaking, when you do your first venture capital round. Because the idea is, is when the venture capitalist shows up, they're going to have an idea on what valuation really is. They are, in theory, the sophisticated player in the space who can apply evaluation to the company. And so investor, seed investor, angel investor, and founder alike agree to wait. So the angel will invest their million dollars. They'll get a note. They'll hang out in the liability portion of the balance sheet. And then when the VC shows up um, and applies a valuation to the company that everybody signs off on, then the VC will put their new money in as equity, buying preferred shares. And the angel investor's note will convert into the same preferred shares. And just for the record, just so you know, angels, as we described, have wings and a halo. That's how you identify them. VCs are a little bit different. They have a Patagonia vest and they're wearing Alberts. And they usually have kind of a cool bag and it probably has sapiens in it because they're thought leaders. So that's how you can identify a venture investor in the wild. But when the venture investor shows up and applies valuation, that's our trigger point here. So if using our prior example, if the venture investor had said pre-money valuation is $10 million. And if our pre-money equity is 10 million shares, then the price per share is a buck. And if the venture investor is investing $5 million, let's say, then 5 million divided by a buck is 5 million shares. That's for the venture investor. What about our angel investor? Well, they have the $1 million in principal plus interest. So maybe at this point it's, you know, maybe it's $1.1 million, just depending upon the time of conversion, you add the interest to it. You take that $1.1 million, you divide it by a buck, they get 1.1 million shares. Boom, okay? And now our cap table is accurate, everything's up to date, everybody's happy. And this worked for a while. It worked for a little bit longer than just the basic note did, but after a while the angel investors got a little edgy again. And the angel investors didn't like that they were investing early but we're getting the same price per share as the venture investors. They felt like they needed to get something a little bit different and a little bit better. And the initial way that we handled that was through the application of a discount. And with a discount, could be 5%, could be 50%, but it's usually 20%. And that's the typical market for it. So if our venture investor is, is investing at a price per share of a dollar, our note would be converting at a price per share of 80 cents, okay? A 20% discount off a dollar is 80 cents. And that's good for the angel investor because the lower the denominator, the more shares they get. So they're gonna get a few more than 1.1 million shares. It'll be $1.1 million divided by 80 cents 
rather than $1.1 million divided by a dollar. That's why a discount's valuable. And that worked for a while and people were happy with it. But then the angel investors got distressed again. And now we're talking 2010, 2011-ish. And there was this concept introduced of a cap. And a cap is expressed as a valuation number because what angel investors were finding was that the discount was not giving them enough bang for their buck. They still didn't feel like that 80 cents was adequate consideration for the stage at which they invested. And they said, you know, this venture investor is showing up when the company has a valuation of $10 million, but it did not have that valuation when we invested. So what we're going to say is, is we will never convert at a valuation higher than $2 million, $3 million, $5 million, it gets negotiated. But what happens is, is when you're running your math, the venture investor's valuation gets inserted here and it's a valuation number. But for the angel investor, what gets inserted is their cap. This is where the cap goes. The cap and the valuation are interchangeable, okay, within this formulation. Now, what you may be thinking is, is, well, if you're talking about a cap, you are talking about a valuation number. And if you're talking about valuation, isn't that a problem? Because isn't the whole point of a note that you don't have to talk about valuation? And my answer to you would be, thank you for listening. And you're exactly right. But we still use notes, notwithstanding that issue, because the original ra rationalization for notes has changed. So in 1997, we wanted notes because we couldn't agree on valuation. But today, we still use notes, not because we can't agree on valuation. We can, because we have 25 years of experience with these companies now. We know how these companies should be valued, or at least we have a sense as to what the relative range is. So we can get to a cap. But we like to use the notes because they're pretty simple. Okay, preferred stock has got a little complexity to it when you, when you lay it out. And there are some other elements that can, that can find their way into preferred stock. But a note, here, you're looking at it. It's as simple as this. It's a simple instrument with just a couple of dials to turn. It's very cheap. You don't have to pay your lawyers very much. Wham, bam, and you're done, okay? Transaction complete. So convertible notes, notwithstanding the fact that we can talk about valuation now, and notwithstanding the fact that we are talking about valuation by virtue of including a cap, we still use convertible notes just because they're simple. Final point, and hang with me through this and then we will be done. Final four minutes. There's something called a safe now. This was invented by Y Combinator, which is an accelerator in Northern California. And they invented this in 2013, and it's an acronym, Simple Agreement for Equity. And what they try to do is to say, look, preferred stock is complicated. We don't want to do that. Convertible notes are great, except we don't like interest rates because it's kind of funky from a tax perspective and nobody really cares about it or believes that it matters. And let's just eliminate that, that complexity. And let's get rid of maturity dates because nobody likes maturity dates, it puts undue pressure, especially on the founders. But we like this notion of getting money in the company and we're happy to work with a discount and or a cap. So this is what a safe is, okay? It has a principal amount or an investment amount, and it will have a discount and or a cap normally. And it's a convertible instrument. The whole notion is at some point, it's going to convert into equity, and it will convert into equity when Mr. or Mrs. Albert shows up, all right? That's what a safe is. Now, keep in mind, we've eliminated the interest rate, and we've eliminated the maturity date, which means it cannot be debt, okay? A safe is not debt. So it has to be, it has to fit within the equity box because it can't be debt, no interest rate, no maturity date. Well, what kind of equity is it? It is a right to acquire stock. Another word for that that some of you may be familiar with, it's an option. Another word for option is a warrant, okay? So it's an option. It's a warrant. It is a right to acquire stock. And it, you have that right by purchasing it. And the moment that you acquire that stock is when it converts into preferred stock side by side with the venture investor when they show up. What's special about a safe, contrasted with your typical option or warrant, is usually 
you have this timeline and this is the date of issuance of the option and this is when the stock is received. And normally with options and warrants, and maybe if you had these at your place of work, you recall that you get your stock when you pay your money, okay? Whatever is due under the option or warrant, you pay that and then you get your stock. With a safe, the money comes up front. So it's a prepaid option. It's a prepaid warrant and it works very well. And it's proven to be a very elegant instrument um, for purposes of these transactions. So we have reached the end of the program. I know it was a sprint. Um, I really appreciate your patience and attention throughout. Here is my email address again. I'd be happy to field any questions um, and even to set up a follow-up telephone call if that's of interest to anyone. Uh, but thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you. I hope you got something out of it, maybe two things out of it. And uh, look forward to hearing from all of you and enjoy the rest of uh, Startup Week.